Can you turn a handful of transistors, diodes, wire, resistors, and other electronic parts into a working metal detector? Is it possible to do a DIY metal detector? Well, I'm here to tell you that yes, it is possible. However, my channel is known for being honest about things. I don't overhype stuff. And to build your own DIY metal detector, that's a difficult project. It's a tall ask. And I'm gonna be saying over and over again that this is not something that's easy to do. To be honest, most of you will not be qualified to do this project. It'll be too much for you. Some will, however, some will be able to take it on. And uh, I'm gonna talk about what you need to know and what it takes to really build your own DIY metal detector. Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and in this video, we're delving into what it takes to build a metal detector. Now, in order to really know what you're doing and to solve any problems that you run into during the build, you need to know how a metal detector works. So if you're really not so much interested in actually building your own DIY metal detector, you might want to stay tuned for this video because I'm going to talk about how metal detectors work and actually understanding how metal detectors work can make you a better metal detector operator. And so it really is worthwhile, even if by the end of this video you think, yeah, maybe my own DIY metal detector is just too big a project to take on. By the end of this video, you'll know if a DIY metal detector is really something that you want to tackle. Now, there really is a whole community of people who work on making their own metal detectors, building their own coils, and all the things that go with it. They enjoy these types of things. They're very knowledgeable about what it takes to do them. And maybe after watching this video and seeing more about what it takes and understanding how a detector works, you'll want to be a part of that community. Now, there are a number of advantages to building your own metal detector. It can be a fun and rewarding project, and you know, you get to learn more about the electronics and how they work. Additionally, building your own metal detector can allow you to save significant money compared to what it costs to buy one on the market. And also, you have the opportunity, if you're really knowledgeable about these things, to customize and you know, make changes and additions that you might want to make the detector work better for you and fit your own needs and preferences. However, there are some downsides to consider and one is the time and the effort required to build one and the potential for it to, to invest a lot of time in putting it together and then find that it doesn't work out as well as a readily available commercial detector. Building your own metal detector can be, a, like I say, a very challenging project especially if you don't have any experience previously assembling electronic systems. Now, like I say, the guys that are involved in doing this in the community, they've built all sorts of different things uh, electronically, made their own this, that, and the other electronic unit. And so when it comes to metal detectors, it's like, oh, this is another thing that's similar to what I've built before. But if you have never done something like this, this is kind of an advanced project to take on as your first effort. It's something that really can take a lot of time and require a lot of patience. And like I say, in the end, a DIY metal detector may not be as powerful, as accurate, or as useful as something that you can buy on the market commercially. I'm gonna say right here that, you know, designing um, a metal detector system with all the physics and all the electronics that you need to understand you know, they pay people who are highly knowledgeable, the metal detector companies, to develop, to do research and development on these projects. And it, you know, when a new detector comes out, many tens of thousands, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of dollars have been invested in the design of that project. And so they're not gonna just come out on the internet and say, hey, I spent uh, $200,000 designing this project for my company, but uh, the company said it's okay for me to release it to the public and let everybody build their own. It's, it's proprietary knowledge. It's proprietary information that they've worked hard to gain and the metal detector companies protect their circuits and secrets very carefully. 
Now, I think that to make something as complex as a metal detector, you need to understand how it works. You need to understand something complex as this and understand what you're building. Um, that's why we'll begin this video on building your own metal detector with uh, talking about the basics of how metal detectors function, you know, how electricity flowing in a wire generates an electromagnetic field, uh, the wire, you know, what they do, you know, any, any electronic, any electrical wire generates a field. And, you know, you see the uh, power lines maybe in front of your house or, you know, on the street. And there's a, a, an invisible electromagnetic field around the wire as power flows through it. That wire can then be wrapped in a coil, you know, to circles of circles that go back and forth to strengthen the magnetic field that comes out of the, the wires. If, you know, just a straight wire has a certain field, wrapping it around and around and around and around and around makes for a stronger field. Let me show you, let's take a look at some illustrations. So we know that a regular bar magnet like this has natural electromagnetic fields that come out of it. You get a pole, a north pole, and a south pole of the magnet. And these field lines come out of it and go around and connect from one end to the other. And here the same kind of field lines are generated by running electricity through a coil of wire. You can see that these lines are just an illustration, but uh, the coil has been kind of pulled apart so you can see it more like a spring. But you can scrunch the coil down, you would still have the same magnetic field lines. Metal detectors work by using these electromagnetic fields to detect metal objects. When a metal object is near one of these electromagnetic fields, believe it or not, the field itself, as it's moving, induces electrical current in the metallic object. That's why it's called a metal detector. It detects things that can conduct electricity. And so the magnetic field induces uh, magnetic field in the object. The object, because it now has electricity in it, produces its own magnetic field and that's what the metal detector sees. When the metal detector sees the secondary field being produced by the object in the ground from the electromagnetic field in the coil, the response coming back is analyzed by the metal detector and a signal or some other thing is given to the operator to know that you're over something that conducts electricity. I know that's kind of complex, but let me draw some things on the board here to kind of explain to you better what I mean about how these electrical fields work and make an object detectable by your metal detector. So let's say you have a coil of wire This is the coil of wire from the head of your metal detector. And there is a field that comes out of this. It goes both ways. It goes up and it goes down. To a much lesser extent, it goes out to the sides. The stronger fields are up and down. All right, so as you put electricity into the coil, it generates a magnetic field. And then if you have an object here, let's say a gold nugget, the field here actually creates an electrical field in electrical current conduction in the gold nugget. And the gold nugget then has its own electrical field. The fact that moving electrical fields in an object can induce current in a secondary object like this is exactly how generators work. So you have like a big hydro dam and it uh, has water going through under pressure. It makes a thing spin. Well, this thing has magnets on it. And as the magnets spin, there's copper wire around the edges of the generator. And the magnets spin and they induce uh, electricity into the wire of the generator and then the generator the electricity goes out and you know it may go to your house if your house runs off of hydropower um, you know after hundreds of miles away you know from a dam that produces electricity like hoover dam or something like that but on a much 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 smaller scale 
This field in your metal detector coil induces electricity in the gold nugget, and the gold nugget makes its own little miniature electronic field. Well, the metal detector coil, through different ways, and we'll talk about the different ways in a second, is able to see the little magnetic field on the nugget. That's the basic concept of how metal detectors work. Let's talk about the basic designs of metal detectors because uh, they do this detection, you know, all of them produce this field, all of them induce the field in the, the target, but they detect it in a little bit different ways. So there's three different kinds and one of them is called a pulse induction machine. These are commonly used by uh, metal detector guys looking for gold nuggets. They're less common in the coin and relic industry. Uh, they're used sometimes for um, looking for lost rings and coins and stuff on beaches. But how a pulse induction machine works, if it has a, a mono coil, is it will put electricity into the, the coil, which creates this field. It will induce the, the field in the nugget or other target object, and then the electricity in this coil shuts off, right? Just for a brief period of time, and it looks to see this field. And because this field can actually then induce electricity into the search coil. The, see, because initially it was transmitting a field, now it stops and it's looking to see or receive a field coming back to it from the target. And the times that, you know, it cycles back and forth, off on, off on, off, 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 and, you know, off and on real fast, I mean, many thousands of times a second, and, and it's able to see these fields. Now, there are other types of coils, we'll talk about coils in a second, but the other type of metal detector that's most common is called a VLF or induction balance. Um, and, and basically all of those coils have two search coils in there in the head of the metal detector, okay? And the electricity in the two coils is cycling off and on like a sine wave, only the two coils are opposite. So uh, this coil is negative and positive and negative and positive. And, and so if you, whatever the, you are in the cycle of these two, they cancel each other out. So if one is plus one volt, the other is minus one volt, and then they switch, they keep going back and forth. And by being equal in opposite directions, they produce what's called an induction balance. So the, the field that they produce is neutralized. It's um, going in different directions. So neither one is inducing something in this coil. All right. So then the field comes down, it hits the target, it induces electricity in the target, and the field that comes back from this disturbs the balance. Instead of having this, you know, counteracting each other and going in different directions, the field from this messes with that. And so it's, it's no longer balanced. That's why they call it an induction balance because it's balanced. Uh, very low frequency has to do with the frequency of this cycle. The induction balance is disturbed. The metal detector notes that and then is able to tell you what, that something is, you found something. The third type, which is, you know, metal detector makers haven't made these in decades. They're called a BFO. And, uh, you know, you can still maybe find old used ones. And I, there may even be a few uh, make your own BFO circuits, uh, you know, that you could find a circuit for your own metal detector on the internet. But with those, they basically have two coils separated by a distance. And the sound that the thing makes is a, a kind of a puttering sound and, and it increases in speed when you go over target. So you would hear bup, 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 bup. And then if you got over target, it'd be bup, 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 b
the beat frequency, right? That's that bup, 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 bup. The beat frequency changes when you go over target. So, but I don't recommend BFOs. They don't make them. Uh, it's not a technology that's, it's a technology that's obsolete, okay? Okay, let's talk a little about coils. All metal detectors have a basic design of some sort of stick that everything is mounted on. You have a control box with the electronics and usually any adjustments off on, uh, you know, volume gain, that sort of thing. And then at the far end, you have a coil that is the coil we've been talking about that sends the electromagnetic field into the ground. So let's talk a little bit about these coils. Now there's a number of different designs. I've got three designs here. These are the three most common and most popular, but there are other kinds. I'm not trying to say there's no such other thing than these three, the, but these are the three most common. Now this uh, is the mono coil. It's just a single wrapping of coil and it's only usable in a pulse induction machine because what happens is this mono coil acts as both the transmit coil that transmit the electric field into the ground and the receive coil that sees the, the uh, target's electromagnetic field coming back at it. So that's how it turns, it turns on, it puts out an electromagnetic field uh, and with a monocoil and then the pulse induction machine turns off and it looks then for the, the target in the ground. You can only use these with a pulse induction machine. Now, uh, VLF, the most popular, is the concentric coil. And the outer coil is the transmit coil. So there's a coil that transmits electromagnetic fields into the ground. And then this inner coil is the receive coil. It's the coil that's looking for something, you know, disturbing the induction balance. So that's the most the common type is the concentric. And then third is the double D. Now double Ds are used with both pulse induction machines and VLF type machines. And basically you have two coils. One coil acts as the transmit coil. The other coil acts as the receive coil. So one coil is transmitting uh, a, a field into the ground. The other is looking for the response. And, and so, in even, but even with a PI using a double D, you still have that off, on, off, on, off, on. And when on, the transmit coil, uh, you know, is transmitting and when off, the receive coil is looking. So these are the three different kinds of, of coil, at least the most common ones. Now, it's more than just a coil of copper wire. They're always made out of copper wire. There's different kinds of copper wire that are used sometimes. Usually they're comparatively small diameter, um, but it's more than just a wrapping of so many loops of coil. Uh, a coil needs to be have a specific inductance. So the field that's generated by this needs to be in a certain range for the metal detector to use it. The inductance, the, the Henry's of, of field that, the electromagnetic field that it generates has to be in a certain range. You just can't put 10,000 uh, wrappings of coil in a machine if it's not looking for that level of field. So it, it has to be tuned and working with the, uh, the, the machine, the electronic parts that are looking at it and trying to sense an object. Uh, coils need to be uh, shielded. They can't, you can't just have a wrapping of wire, uh, maybe taped with a few pieces of tape together. Uh, they need to be shielded with some sort of shielding tape or a uh, metal gauze, something to protect it from outside interference, which greatly in, uh, increases its performance and, and ability to see things in the ground. So that's a little quick thing about coils. Another important thing about metal detectors is their ability to balance out ground minerals and handle mineralized soils. Um, you know, we all have heard of things like black sand and their iron is actually the uh, fourth most common element in the Earth's crust. So there's a lot of iron everywhere. And it just happens to be that iron mineralization is common in areas with gold mineralization. They kind of go together. And so uh, the iron mineralization, you know, the, the metal detector we talked about with the coils, it sees things that produce 
electromagnetic fields, things that react to the electromagnetic field generated by the coil. Well, there's things like black sand that magnets stick to. This rock here is basically a giant piece of black sand. It's a mineral called magnetite and it reacts with a magnet. It's called magnetite because magnets stick to them. And you can actually generate, you can actually magnetize one of these rocks and it can become a weak magnet on its own. Those minerals are in the ground. And like I say, they're more common in areas that are mineralized with gold. But they're, uh, they're common in other areas that don't have gold mineralization either. They're, they're not a guarantee. Um, but ground balance is especially important for prospecting because of the presence of these iron-rich minerals. This is not metallic iron like steel. This is a mineral. It's an iron oxide. And, but it's a natural mineral. It was formed in the ground. Because gold-bearing areas tend to have a lot of these iron minerals in the ground, then uh, the metal detector needs to be able to cancel out or deal with those iron minerals in the ground. And that's called ground balance. And most detectors have an adjustment or they do it automatically. Either the detector has an adjustment that you can adjust yourself or the metal detector will do it for you. It will take a reading of how much uh, mineralization is in the soil and then adjust its readings for that. And part of the thing is, is that the signal from these iron minerals in the ground can be hundreds of times, even a thousand times stronger than the field that comes back from like a small gold nugget. So being able to balance these things is important. Sadly, none of the DIY metal detector units, uh, uh, circuit designs that I've seen have a ground balance circuit, but maybe you'll be able to develop one that you could use on yours. Modern metal detectors also process the raw signal from the receive coil and analyze it. And the signal processing includes evaluating the signal for what it is. A part of this includes the discrimination of iron, metallic iron junk, like bits of tin can, old, you know, nails and pieces of nails and tacks and stuff like that. And to be able to tell the operator that this is not now, this is likely iron trash. These metal detectors do this because of the inductance of the received target. So the detector is able to see the inductance coming back to the receive coil and elements that conduct electricity really well have good inductance and the metal detector will say, oh, this is a not, this is a good conductor like gold, but also like copper, brass, silver, other things that aren't iron. Iron tends to be a poor conductor and will give low inductance readings. And that's how the metal detectors work to discriminate trash from uh, things that aren't junk or aren't iron, rusty iron junk, because you can still get, you know, smash bits of lead, uh, you know, old copper or brass uh, shell casings, you know, things like that. And those aren't really what you're looking for if you're looking for gold nuggets, but they're not rusty iron trash. And that's all that discrimination, this discrimination system discriminates. It discriminates rusty iron junk from uh, things that aren't iron. Again, none of the circuits that we're going to talk about have a discrimination element to them. Again, like I say, the design of these circuits is complex. It usually involves teams of engineers and the metal detector companies aren't eager to give out their secrets, you know, both to have people who want, might want to design their own metal detector from the circuits, but also to their competitors. I mean, if you're metal detector company A and you, your engineers have spent a lot of time des designing a new discrimination circuit that works really well, you don't want to put that out in the public so that your competitor will say, huh, that's really a great idea. I'm stealing it. You know, I, they're very secretive and, and protective. They have patents and stuff like that, but they're very careful about what they release to the public. 
So after all that talking about how metal detectors work, let's talk about the circuit designs themselves. And I've got three of them to, to show you. There are more on the internet, but I'm going to talk about three basic ones, how they work, and how you can get involved with building your own metal detector. So this is my first project that I'm suggesting to you, or at least uh, showing to you. It's a very, very simple metal detector. Um, it employs only four transistors and that's part of its simplicity it uses two nine volt batteries and you know you might wonder how powerful this is it's really not particularly powerful or sensitive but it's simple and at the bottom i have a link that says for more details see and then it gives a, a web address and then you can use that to find more information about this. Now you might ask, hey, Chris, if uh, this is such a low power, literally not much more than a toy type of metal detector, why have you included it? Well, for the guys who have never built an electronic project before, you don't want to start out with your first project being the most complicated thing that you could imagine. This is a simpler project for a starting point. It will sense metal. Um, it has a phone jack, so you would use headphones to hear the output. Again, this is the first one. And if you want to find out more, follow that link uh, that I've listed on the image. And if you're really interested in this, you know, take a screenshot and then you can look at this uh, in more detail. Okay, on to the next. This is my next project that I want to suggest to you. It's a much more sensitive, uh, more complex uh, metal detector. It employs two ICs, uh, 555 timer chips, and two transistors, uh, a regular NPN type, and a field effect transistor. Effectively, it has 50 transistors because in each of the 555 ICs, there's uh, 24 transistor circuits. And so, but plus the other two, you have 50. It's much more sensitive. It's much more tunable. You do have both a uh, transmit and receive coil. It's a VLF type unit. And I'm sure if properly made, that it could be used at least to hunt coins and uh, other objects of decent size in parks and schools. If you take a screenshot of this up at the top of the page, you can see I have listed for more information and have a website with uh, quite a bit more information about this particular circuit. This is my third and final circuit diagram for a metal detector. And just as the second one was worlds more complex than the first, this third is worlds more complex than the second. This one does actually have some sort of ground tracking system on it. Um, it was made by Heathkit for people to build, so it is buildable. But unfortunately, Heathkit went out of business in 1992, and even though they've been resurrected as of 30 years later in 2022, they don't make their metal detector kits anymore. They just do radios and stuff. If you're more interested in this more complex circuit, this circuit that is probably capable of finding uh, some larger size nuggets and dealing with various field conditions that you might encounter in nugget detecting, I'd urge you to go to the website that I've listed here at hobbyhour.com. You can just Google Heathkit ground track 1290 metal detector, and you'll get a lot of information, including copies of this circuit diagram. So that's my presentation of three of the best possibilities, I think, for individuals who want to try and design their own metal detector. So in all of these metal detector projects, and in fact, in any electronic build project, any kind of DIY circuit, there's an important issue of troubleshooting DIY circuits. Um, you know, every component has to be right. You just can't toss in, you know, if you're supposed to put in a transistor, well, just put in any old transistor. Or if you're supposed to put in a capacitor, oh, just put in any old capacitor. It doesn't work. You have to put in the right transistor, the right uh, resistor, you know, within the right range, the right capacitor range, in order for things to work. And then on top of that, everything has to make a perfect connection. And so, you know, if you install an old capacitor from a previous project or something that a capacitor that you bought and maybe it's bad or something, um, 
you know, everything has to connect. And then, you know, if something's wrong, you have to figure out where the wrong is. Every connection must work and work and conduct electricity and be correctly connected, right? You can't connect, oops, it's supposed to connect to this part and then you accidentally connected it to that part. The problem is with this is, is there's an infinite number of possible problems that might occur in a DIY circuit. And I can't really help you with that. I, I mean, that's something that if you take this project on, you'll kind of be on your own. Now, if you are part of some of those communities that do projects like this, you know, maybe somebody in the community can uh, assist you and help get you on the right track. Now, uh, we're here for the final Jeopardy question. And the final Jeopardy question for this video is, is a DIY metal detector a good project for you? You must decide the right answer for yourself. I can't tell you that. You have to decide. If you don't already know how to read a circuit diagram like the ones I've just shown you, if you can't just look at the diagram and say, oh, that's a transistor, this is a capacitor, this is a resistor, that's a diode, this is an IC chip. If you just don't know by looking at the diagram what everything is, you're probably a lot behind the ball on this and it may not be the right project for you. Now, there is information on the internet Lord knows, there's no question that you could watch videos and read some things and learn about a circuitry and that kind of stuff and learn what all those symbols on the diagram are and, you know, understand the ratings, you know, for so many ohms resistance for a resistor, uh, so many microfarads for a capacitor, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can do that. But what I'm saying is you're starting out in a hole and you're going to spend a bunch of time learning that before you can even get to putting together a project. And before you can really sit down to do the project, you have to have all those right pieces. You have to have the resistors that are in the right range, the transistors that are the right ones, the capacitors in the right range, the diodes, everything. You have to have the right kind, right IC circuits, uh, IC chips. You have to have that in order to start. But again, I tell you, it's something you need to decide for yourself. Is this a project that you really want to take on? So think about it and take your time and decide really honestly if this is the right kind of project for you. For some of you, this kind of project will be right up your alley. You, you looked at all those diagrams that I showed you and, and you understood just glancing at them. But others of you will look at circuits like that and it's like, it's all Greek to me. I don't know what that means. You know, let me show you a real metal detector circuit. This is a real metal detector circuit from a, a metal detector that is in part designed to find gold. So take a look. Is something like this really something that would be a project that you think you could complete? Could you put together something like this? Is this really the type of project you think you could complete? It would be quite an accomplishment if you did, but is this your kind of project? On the other hand, the best of the metal detector circuits that I've shown you are really not that great. This is a 1990s, early 90s, metal detector from Radio Shack. It has no ground balance. It does have a discrimination function, which I, I can't say I've really tested out well that I could tell you how well it works. But this is a primitive, primitive metal detector compared to what's available on the market from metal detector manufacturers. This is the basic level that DIY metal detectors are. This would probably be okay. I'll bet I could take this you know, put new batteries in it and take it out to the park and run it around. I'll bet I could find a couple of coins and that sort of thing. But coins are giant targets. Coins are really not, they're huge compared to the nuggets that I find. And this, this metal detector is not suitable for metal detecting for nuggets. It's only barely suitable for metal detecting for coins. If you make your own DIY detector, you'll end up with something that's comparable to this. It has a discrimination function, but it has no ground balance. Um, like I say, something more or less equivalent to this. It's primitive compared to what's available commercially. 
if you do a DIY, unless you have the skills to add your own circuits and understand the physics of metal detecting operations to improve and do your own design, you know, you're gonna end up with something that's pretty weak compared to what you could buy commercially. Now you could teach yourself uh, all the things that you need to know to make your own DIY metal detector, or you could take some of that time and just save up. Maybe work some extra overtime at work. Maybe cut back on the number of lunches or dinners eat out that you eat. Maybe save a few bucks here and there. I don't know, there's lots of ways to save money and everybody has to decide what works for them on their own. When I was a very young family guy with kids, a much younger family guy with kids, not grandkids, but little kids, I couldn't afford a metal detector. And so I saved up and saved up and saved up and bought my first metal detector. It was a Fisher, a VLF TR type. I'm not gonna explain all the differences, but it was a VLF type detector. And you know, it was not a top flight. It was not the best that was available on the market at that time was not a real good detector for finding gold. But, you know, I had uh, some college level engineering courses, including an electrical engineering class. And I understood something about circuits and conductors, but I thought the idea of a DIY metal detector was way beyond me. And so I saved up money and bought that metal detector. And that's what got me started. At first, I only found, you know, coins with it and that kind of stuff, but it got me started on the path. I later bought better detectors and better detectors and better detectors. And now, you know, I'm buying top flight detectors and, and saving up and paying good money for metal detectors. You can get decent stuff for reasonable prices. You just have to save up to get it done. And the truth is you can often find good used ones for a good price. There's a lot of guys who will go out buy a metal detector, of course a lot better one than this, and take it out, find that they find a lot of trash and they don't find a lot of gold and it's difficult and they don't wanna put in the work to learn to be a successful prospector. And so they give up and they sell their metal detector. And so you end up being able to buy a, a good metal detector, hardly used, and buy it for cheap. You just gotta keep an eye on the used metal detector market and. You know, there's a lot of uh, forums and websites and that kind of stuff that will have used metal detectors on it. Uh, sometimes dealers have used metal detectors too. So just check it out, keep your eyes open and take more shopping to find that right used detector than to buy a new one. But it's another opportunity to save some money. But all in all, whether you save up and buy one or you build one for yourself or whatever you do, acquiring a Good quality metal detector is just the first step in finding gold with a detector. The real step, the big step, is learning to put the coil of the detector over a nugget. And that's going out in the field and knowing where nuggets are. That's the skill of the prospector to be able to go out and find your own gold. The truth is you find the gold. The detector just tells you when you put the coil over the top of one, but you have to take it out there where the gold is, where the gold is coarse enough to be seen with a detector and close enough to the surface. Now, if you want to learn those skills, if that's what you want to be successful at in finding your own gold, I wrote a book about finding your old, own gold called Fistful of Gold. It's a great text. It's got all the information you need, geology and all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called This Full of Gold, and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself This Full of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed, and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon, and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month 
and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below, but there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos. And so we'll see you again real soon.